Okay, good morning everyone. Um, I apologize you're watching a very edited uh, service, actually not even edited. I was actually just came back from a fire call, so we missed the first part of the singing. So you'll still get the message and the closing song and the benediction, but you'll miss everything that happened beforehand. I apologize, but when the alarm bells go, you gotta respond sometime. Also, I thought it was supposed to be, I apologize to everyone here. I thought it was actually gonna be a really short call. I thought I was gonna be back in plenty of time. It didn't work out that way. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for this time, for this opportunity we have just to come together to worship you today, Lord. Um, yeah, Lord, we just pray, pray for all my brothers and sisters, firefighters who are still on the call, Lord, uh, just so they can get released soon and be able to go back home and get back to their days, Lord, and just for safety for all of them. In your name we pray, amen. So I also have to admit, this is just a crazy Sunday because I couldn't get my sermon to print this morning. So we're doing it off of memory. So it's going to be a little shorter, but considering also we're starting a little bit later, that's okay. So I'm going to start with a question though. Who here likes to watch the Olympics? Okay, there we go. Just about everyone likes to watch the Olympics. I enjoy watching the Olympics, but you know what? As a kid, and that's when I got my love for watching the Olympics, I never would have actually watched the Olympics, except for when I was a kid, and our children can't relate to this, but everyone else can, as adults. Growing up during the summer, especially when it was the Summer Olympics, during the summer, what was on TV during the Olympics time? It was Olympics, 24-7, you know? When you had peasant vision, you only had CBC. CBC just aired. Olympic coverage around the clock until they went off air at night. So if you want to watch TV and as a kid growing up in a rural area, you didn't have a lot to do, you watch the Olympics. But I'm glad for that because I actually got to have an appreciation for the Olympics and I got introduced to sports that I never thought I would enjoy. Um, I really developed a passion actually for, let's see if you guys can guess, what sport do you think I enjoyed watching the most in the Olympics? Other than my wife, because I've told her and she may remember. Can anyone else guess which sport you think I would enjoy? Backwards football. So shut up, you. <laughs> <laughs> no, not soccer, not rugby. Hockey? Nope. No, nope, not even, not even field oh. hockey. No. Any other guesses? Football? No. Ice nope. hockey. It's Summer Olympics, but <laughs> I actually really enjoyed watching the rowing and canoeing. That was my favorite sport to watch as a kid. You know, because I mean, it's my attention span too. I mean, the races didn't go more than a couple minutes, but just, I don't know what it is. It just really drew me in and I really enjoyed watching that. But you know what? My other favorite thing to watch in the Olympics wasn't actually a sport. It was the opening ceremonies. Now, you think of the opening ceremonies, that's the big, how they started off. It's a big hoorah and grandiose and all that kind of stuff. I actually, you know what, not that I didn't like them, I enjoyed that, but my favorite part of the opening ceremonies was the parade, the parade of nations when all the teams came out with all their members, and I always enjoyed watching, you know, who would be the flag bearer, right, for every country, because the country, if they had their flag bearer, their flag bearer would be their best athlete, you know, the one they figured was going to do, win the most medals, or was the most famous, and they always used to, not as much anymore, but they used to just base it on academic, or not academic, athletic prowess. So you always put your best athletes first and you know all the athletes around them and the few behind them, you know, those are always your top, top athletes. And the further you got, the more athletes, they were just there. And you know, I always kind of felt bad sometimes when you look especially like countries like Canada, United States, many European countries that would have, you know, a lot of Olympians go. You know, the commentators, when they're showing, oh yeah, here's the flag bearer. And, oh, beside the flag bearer is so-and-so and so-and-so. And, and they kind of start to talk about. But then when they get to the end of the line, you know, they're just going to skip the last dozen or so people and they just start talking about the next nation in line, right? I always felt bad for those people at the end of the line because they were ignored. Because, well, they weren't important. They weren't going to win a medal. They weren't in any flashy event. So, well, we don't really care about them. I will say one thing that I enjoyed and it happened in a Summer Olympics not too long ago, or maybe it was even a Winter Olympics. Because every once in a while, you'll have those countries, pretty much every Olympics, you'll have a uh, country that only has maybe one or two people representing them, right? Usually it's like the African countries in a, in a, in a, in a, in a Northern, or Northern Olympics, 
in a Winter Olympics or whatnot. Well, there was one time this one guy, he was the only person and he was this flag bearer. And you know, he was gonna make the most of his Olympic time there. Because you know, we know people that carry their flag, they march all solemnly through. Not this guy, this guy's dancing, he's having fun, he's waving to the crowd, he was just <laughs> giving her. And that what I love. It's it's always it's always been a point in time for me in the Olympics when you see that, when you see the parade of athletes. Even now that we don't have the CBC coverage, that we don't watch it like we used to because we don't have CBC anymore, because uh, they don't have the free channel. We, um, I would still try and watch that on YouTube or on news clips or whatnot just to see the Pareto athletes. In our passage today, which is 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 6 to 21, so that's the whole, or, sorry, 8 to 21, that's the whole rest of the chapter. Paul actually uses very similar imagery into what we just talked about in the Olympics. Now, since it's such a big passage, I'm not actually going to be reading the whole thing today. Uh, I'm just going to be highlighting it, and like I said, unfortunately, because I don't have my sermon here in front of me, because it wouldn't print, I may miss some of it, but um, it's really a great passage to read and to go through. Now, one of the things that I will start off by saying, that in the Bible, there are some people, a lot of Christians, I shouldn't say a lot, there are some Christians who believe that sarcasm is a bad thing, that you know, sarcasm has no place in the Bible has no place in Christianity, but yet God himself in the Bible uses sarcasm. You know, authors use sarcasm. Prophets use sarcasm. I mean, the great example of that is, you know, Elijah, when he's facing off against the prophets of Baal, he's using sarcasm. He's mark mocking those prophets the entire time. Later on, one of the other major prophets, you know, is using sarcasm when he talks about people who bow down to idols and make idols with their own hands and then start worshiping something they've just made. So I hate to say it, Diverse some people's Bibles, but sarcasm actually is part of the Bible. And we really see this in this passage today because that's what the Apostle Paul uses here. Apostle Paul uses a lot of sarcasm in this passage today. He uses sarcasm because he starts off when he talks about the Corinthians. He says, you know what, you guys, you guys, you're, you're rich, you're kings, you're all of this kind of stuff, right? And he talks about all these good things that the Corinthians are. But yet he says, we apostles, what are we? Well, if you're the, you're rich, we're poor. If you're the kings, we're the lowly people. And he just uses sarcasm to build that idea. Even here in verse, sorry, my Bible, it's in a little different place, uh, or not different place on the page, it's on a different place, the same verse. Uh, verse nine, for it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession, like men condemned to die in the arena, we have been made spectacles of spectacles, spectacles to the whole universe, to the angels as well as to men. Sorry if I get a little tongue-tied. The adrenaline's still a little jacked from the fire call, even though it's a slow fire call. Um, Paul here gives an imagery that we aren't as familiar with today. Like I said, the only thing we have today is like the Olympics when we have the parade of nations. And you've got your best athletes at the front of the parade, and you got the lesser athletes, the, the guys that are known very well, you know, put at the back. Like, did you guys know, it's actually funny, but an Olympic event is actually shotgun? Like, skeet shooting is actually an Olympic event? Yeah. Yeah. Guess who's always at the end of the line? It's always the skeet, <laughs> skeet shooters for Summer Olympics. But I, I digress on that one. Paul here gives a similar imagery, but it's not the Olympic Games he's talking about. He's talking about something that all the Roman readers, everyone in that culture will be familiar with. Whenever a victorious Roman general came back from a campaign against a foreign nation and he was victorious, what would they do? They would march through the city and they would have a giant parade. And the first person in the parade would obviously be the victorious general. And then behind him, his other generals, his other officers, and then his soldiers. And then after that came all his his bounty, all of his loot, all of his plunder that he got. And in the beginning of that procession, what would it have? It would have the kings that he had conquered, the chieftains, the nobles. All those people would be at the beginning of the procession, those really great people and strong people that he had conquered. And then at the end of the line, who would it be? It would be the, the, the soldiers they captured. It would be the slaves that they captured. It would be the people that no one really cared about. And what was destined for these people? Well, those kings, those chiefs, those generals at the, the front of the prisoner line, 
They would be held as hostage because of political treaties and all that kind of stuff. Or they would be, they would be ransomed off for large sums of money. So they would live good lives the rest of their lives. They'd either go back home or they would be a hostage. And when I say hostage, they would just live like they did at home under Roman guard and they'd just be somewhere really nice and get to relax. Well, those guys at the end of the line, those captured soldiers, those captured slaves, where were they destined for? The arenas. They were destined for the Colosseums, where they would be put into gladiatorial games, not as gladiators, but as fodder. They would be put in unarmed or very just lightly armed, put in against wild animals, put against trained gladiators, even sometimes even put against Roman soldiers. And the whole point of them was to go in and to die, and there was nothing else for them. They could never win in their situations. That is what they were destined for. And that's what Paul says that the apostles were like. You know, the Corinthians, these were the guys, they thought they were at the head of the line, that they were so great and better than everyone else. And yet the apostles were at the back of the line like men destined to die. Like I said, Paul uses sarcasm here. He uses his sarcasm to shock the Corinthians. The Corinthians thought that they were so great and so better than everyone else. And yet the apostles, and what does apostle mean? Chosen one, sent one, the one that God sent to the world, his chosen ministers, these are the guys who are acting, you know, are to be seen as slaves, is to be seen as far as the men to die. You know, so much less than the Corinthians. And that's what Paul's saying. It's sarcasm. You guys wake up. You guys think you're better than everyone else, but if we, the apostles, think we're at the bottom, why do you think you're so high? And Paul goes into here and he explains a part of the reason why they Corinthians thought they were so wise and so great, like we talked about last week, is because they were a prideful city. You know, they were rich, they were powerful, they were important in the Roman Empire. They were about the third most important city right after Rome and maybe Athens or um, Antioch, I believe it was. But coupled with this, there had been false teachers who would come into the church. And these people had come in, not even just to teach false doctrine, but they had come in and they used flattery. Oh yes, you Corinthians are so wise. Oh yes, you Corinthians are so great. You're so gifted. You're so special. You're so wonderful. Because when you come in and someone's already prideful, and if you give them a whole bunch of more great things to say about them, they'll listen to you even more. And they'll pay you even more. And that's why they were there. So now the, the Corinthians already had a big head. And now all these false teachers... You know, these, these people come to guard them and help them in the truth. These people had made their heads even bigger and were leading them astray. Instead of saying, you know, focus on God and what God has and what God wants you to do and how he wants to live. It's no, no. They fed into that trap that they were all believing in. You know, God wants you to be rich. God wants you to be powerful. God wants you to be prestigious and honored above everyone else. And they started to buy into that lie. And Paul says, that is not the case. If we, the apostles, the chosen and sent ones, are living like this, like Paul even goes on later in um, verse 11. You know, to this very hour, we go hungry, thirsty. We are in rags, brutally treated. We are homeless. We work hard with our own hands. We are cursed. All this kind of stuff, he goes on and on. If we, the apostles of God, you know, the people that are supposed to be closest to God and most godly, if this is how we are treated, why do you expect to be treated differently? Why do you think you should be better than everyone else? Paul is trying to wake them up to realize they are being led astray by these false teachers. He's trying to humble them in a good way. Because even here, Paul, at the end of the passage, in verses 18 to 21, Paul kind of says, Hey, do you guys want me to come at you with whips? Do you want me to be mean and harsh and tough? Or do you want me to be gentle and come in love? And that's what Paul's trying to do here. He's gently, maybe a little, little more than gently, but gently trying to wake them up in love and say, guys, you know what? You got to humble yourselves. And if you guys are chasing after things of this world, if you're chasing after the honor, the prestige, and the wealth, I mean, what today we would call, they believed in the, the health and wealth gospel, that God wants you to be rich and famous. And if you're not rich and famous, then you're not following God's will. And if you follow God's will, you'll drive a Ferrari and have a mansion and be famous. That's what they were buying into. And Paul says, you can't do that. Because that's not what the gospel is about. That's not what Christianity is about. That's the lies of the world. Stop following the lives of the world. Paul in here, even when he talks about this, he says, 
You know those false teachers you've been following? Those are like guardians. And the word here, guardian, what it meant is someone who was hired by a rich, you know, the aristocracy to look after their sons, to basically walk them back and forth to school. You know, either a bodyguard or a crossing guard. You take your pick what these guys were. And Paul says, you know, you have these guys who, they say they're really great and important, but I'm your father. And a father is much more important than the hired men who come along and lead you astray. He says, live your life like me. Be humble. You know, I think also the other reason why Paul is doing this, because it was so detrimental to their faith to believe this health, wealth, gospel. But the other part of it was, Paul, whether Paul knew it or not, but God knew it was coming. Persecution was coming. Pretty soon, these Corinthians that were treated and honored and rich and all that kind of stuff, when the persecution came from the Roman Empire against Christians, they wouldn't be at the front of the parade. They would literally be at the back of the parade. They would be fed to lions. They would be persecuted, tortured, in jail. I think God is trying to prepare them for that truth that is coming. You know, if you believe that God is just going to bless you and make you rich and make your life easy, you're in for a world of heartache. Right? He wants us to be humble. He wants us to, like Paul said, follow Paul's example, live in the way that he's going to do. Paul even mentions here that he is sending Timothy to help the Corinthians to learn how to live till Paul himself can come and help out a little more. And I think that's, you know, that's a, that's a truth that is for the Corinthians, but I think it's the same as a truth for us today. I mean, I'm not saying that here today we believe in the health, wealth, gospel, you know what? If you're a Christian, God wants to make you a millionaire and drive fancy cars and you'll never be sick and never have cancer. But we know that's not the case. But also to realize we are servants. Like we talked about a couple Sundays ago, we are servants. We are here to serve, to follow God's will, not to be caught up in the lies of the false teachers, not to be caught up in the things that the world chases after, but to follow what God wants us to do, to live the humble life and be focused on God and serving Him. So like I said, that's the lesson that Paul wanted to share with the Corinthians. I think it's a lesson for us today, right? To realize, you know what? We're going to face hard times in life. Even good Christians who God is blessing is going to face hard times in our lives and our walk. Things may be difficult at times, but also to have humility. Because there are other times where God will legitimately bless us and life will be nice. But to realize not to have our faith based off of whether things are, you know, things are good, that means God is with us. If things are bad, that means God is against us. That's not how it works. God is with us all the times, in the highs and in the lows, and we have to follow him. With that, let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you for this message. Lord, I thank you that I made it back in time for the message. And Lord, I just pray, Lord, just that we would learn from this, Lord, that you would just, we would just treasure these things in our heart, Lord, these lessons, these reminders, Lord. In your name we pray, amen.
Number six, uh, verse twenty-four to twenty-six. Uh, it says, "The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord makes His face sh shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turns His face towards you and gives you peace." All right, I'll close this in prayer. Thank you very much, James. Sure. So, uh, for those who are watching online, you didn't realize, but since I was on a fire call, James actually did help with the singing and emceeing for the beginning part of the service because I was calm, which is great. Also, I don't know if it was mentioned earlier to everyone else here, yesterday was James's birthday, and James actually turned the big 1-3. So he's now a teenager. So you just had a teenager lead, you guys. So, so thank you very much, James, for helping out. Let's close in prayer. Help me, Father, we just thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for, yeah, very unorthodox Sunday, but Lord, a lot of our Sundays are. And Lord, we just praise you that we can do that, Lord, that we are just about coming and sharing and learning more about you and worshiping you, Lord. Lord, I just pray for each and every one of us, Lord. We thank you for everyone who came here today, Lord. And Lord, we just pray that we'll have a good week. And Lord, that you'll be with us till we see each other again next week. Lord, we see each other in eternity. In your name we pray. Amen. So thank you very much for coming, everyone. Thank you very much for watching. Have yourselves a wonderful day.